Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Tent of Abraham. I'm Tamir Kreisman from Jerusalem, Israel, and we continue with Pirkei Durabi Eliezer. We are still on chapter 33. This is 33E, Under the Power of Charity, and this one is called The Hard Choice, The Right Call. Hallelujah, Adonai, kol goyim, shabichuhu kol haomim, ki gavar alenu chasdo ve'emet Adonai le'olam, hallelujah. Rabbi Yochanan says, when Israel descended to Babylon, they did not forsake their evil deeds. What action caused the destruction of the first temple and the exile to Babylon? Do we know this? We should know this. Second temple, sure, easy. Baseless hatred. See today. Yes? Okay. But what happened in the first temple? Three things. Avodah Zarah, that's idolatry, shfichut damim, bloodshed, gilui ariot, sexual immorality. We got all those today, too. So, in other words, we're not looking too good to, you know, rectifying what happened in the past. So, these three sins are what the original sin consisted of in the Garden of Eden. We've already been through these classes. Um, go to the earlier teaching teachings from Pirkei de Rebeliezer, specifically regarding Adam, uh, the serpent, the woman, all those teachings. It says we're going into that in detail, but we don't have time right now. Go check those out. So we've also learned that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob did a massive rectification, a massive tikkun for these three sins of Adam, becoming the chariot of God, the Merkava of God in this world, with David later on establishing Malchut, the fourth leg, if you will. So since these were the sins that caused the destruction and the exile, our text tells us that Israel did not forsake their ways even after they were taken, their, uh, taken to Babylon. In other words, their evil ways, after they were already taken to Babylon because of their evil ways. We are indeed a stiff-necked people. <laughs> At some point, it's supposed to help us, you see. So we're not talking about every last one of them. Understand this, of course. As we see, there are plenty of righteous individuals who keep themselves and guard themselves, but the majority had fallen right back into it, if they ever left it at all. The last point we touched upon last week were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who would not bend the knee to the idol while almost everyone else did. Ahab ben Kolia and Tzidkiah uh, uh, ben Masiah became false doctors or healers, Rof'e Shekir. Now, not to be confused with kings Ahab and Zedekiah, these two were false prophets in Babylon. But the Babylonians didn't believe in the Jewish prophets anyway. They're like, yeah, good for you, thus saith what Lord, right? So they became false healers to them and false prophets to Israel. False healers specifically to who? They would quote unquote heal the women or the wives of the Chaldeans and would then sleep with them. Okay. The Radal cites Job 13.4, which we're going to have to take a look at in Hebrew, obviously, since the English says the following. But you combine lies, all of you are quacks. Okay. Ve'ulam atem toflei shaker rof'ei elil kulchem. Toflei shaker, false prophecies, right? Speaking falsely. You're quacks you are. Also a scene in Ezekiel 13, 11, where it says, Emor el tache tafel vaipol. Say to the plasterers. That's what it says. So again, we can't go with the English translation here. And also again, it says in 22, 28, tafel. There's also tafel and ikar. Tafel is mundane. Ikar is the main message, the main purpose, the what is actually important. And our prophets plastered for them with Daub. Prophecy, futility. So as for the false healers, so that's uh, uh, that's the Nevi'e Shekel, the false speakers, right? We got plenty of those today as well. As for the false healers, Rof'e Elil. Listen to the language now. Isaiah 2.8. Vetimale Altso Elilim. And his land is full of idols. Elil, idols. Habakkuk 
מה הועיל פסל כי פסלו יצרו מסכה ומראה שקר כי בטח יוצר יצרו עליו לעשות אלילים אילמים? What did a graven image avail that its maker has graven it? A molten image and a teacher of lies that the maker of his work trusted in, uh, in, trusted in it to make dumb idols, meaning idols that cannot speak. Focus here obviously is on Elilim, Elil. And in Chronicles 16.26 and Psalms 96.5, They're both the same thing. Ki kol Elohei ha'amim elilim, v'adunai shamayim asa. For all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Okay, so we have false prophets, we have false healers. Sounds like cult leaders to me. And when Jews behave this way, especially on foreign soil, if they behave this way on our soil... We get expelled, but if Jews behave this way on foreign soil, oy vavoy. Instead of positively representing their people because, you know, we have a microscope on us at all times, they make it bad for everyone. The king, Nebuchadnezzar, heard of this. What do you hear of? Their deeds. And he said, burn them, meaning these two guys. Jeremiah 29 says this. Now you hearken to the word of the Lord, all the exile that I have sent away from Jerusalem to Babylon. So said the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, concerning Ahab, the son of Koliah, and concerning Zedekiah, the son of Masiah, who prophesy to you falsely in my name. Behold, I deliver them into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. He's prophesying exactly what's going to happen. The king of Babylon, and he shall slay them before your eyes. And a curse shall be taken from them by the entire exile of Judah. Do you see what's happening? When Jews misbehave like this outside of the land of Israel, they bring a curse. A curse upon all of Israel. And you guys are wondering why we can't get our, you know, our act together. It is a problem. And a curse will be taken from them by the entire exile of Judah, which is in Babylon, saying, May the Lord make you like Zedekiah and like Ahab, whom the king of Babylon burnt with fire. This is before it even happened. Because they committed a disgrace in Israel, and they committed adultery with the wives of their neighbors, and they spoke false things in my name, which I had not commanded them. And I am he who knows and witness says the Lord. Oh, I mean, how many times did we speak about you have to be so careful? I believe that the audience over here already knows you, we are no longer of the God told me that thus saith the Lord or Holy Spirit this and that, right? This is what happens. God didn't say this. You do not know. You do not want to know. Uh, we do know. You don't want to know what God is going to bring upon you and upon all of Israel because of you. That is now on your head. So let's just refrain from that. And anybody else who speaks like that, please run for dear life. Okay. And for the sake of us all, when I was living in uh, New York and Vegas or any other place that I would go, and there would be Israelis behaving in the most despicable, disgusting ways. It was, it was shameful. It was embarrassing. Now, make no mistake, these are not all Israelis, obviously, but the public don't really care. You see, they see one bad Israeli, okay? They always make the headlines all over the world. And guess what? <clears throat> they represent Jews in general and Israel, the Israelis in particular. We have a responsibility, people, okay? You think God doesn't see this? Biblical sources, God sees this. And like we just read from Jeremiah, everyone suffers as a result. Zedekiah and Ahab said, Yehoshua ben Yehotzadak is a righteous man. He will come with us and we will be saved in his merit. Say what now? They said to the king, meaning these two guys said to Nebuchadnezzar, this man was with us with everything we did. How could they possibly tie this together? Listen, because Yehoshua's son, sons, who were priests, took foreign wives, as seen in Ezra 10.18. 
And it was found out that the sons of the priests who brought in foreign wives, the sons of Yoshua, the son of Tzadok, of, uh, of Yotzadak, and his brothers, Masiah, Eliezer, Yariv, and Gedalia. Okay? These are priests taking foreign wives. Priests, Kohanim, cannot even take divorcees. Okay? That, you can't do that, although today people are doing it. I forego my priesthood, if you will. Oy vavoy Hashem I mean, this is from the five books of Moses. Anyway, so his son, he was a good, he was a righteous man, like they said, but his sons committed these terrible sins, which prohibited the building of the second temple, right? We read that already in, in, uh, in Ezra. Got to get rid of the foreign wives. So what does this actually have to do with him? Have you ever dealt with a liar? Have you ever dealt with a schemer? How about a self-proclaimed prophet? False, obviously. A leader, a rabbi. False, obviously. I have. These people, like Zedekiah and Ahab, are much more than liars and schemers. They have a persona to keep up, right? And when they get called out, and every now and then they do, which is only a matter of time, they will try their hardest to latch on to anything and anyone on their way down to try and break their fall or shift the blame. It's common practice. Uh, you know, if you swat at a fly, if you are calling them a murderer or whatever they're doing and you swat at a fly, they will call you a murderer. How dare you kill a creature of the Lord? Oh yes, this has actually happened before. And if you didn't, if you didn't swat a fly, if there's no blemish within you, they will point the guilty finger at you by association to have you within their vicinity again to try and soften the blow by throwing attention elsewhere. They are oh, they, Everybody else is to blame, and they are always the victim. See this behavior? It's called narcissistic sociopath. Run. These, of course... Like we said, narcissistic sociopaths, and from where we come, there's no shortage, meaning where we all came from, right? That house of idolatry, there's no shortage of them over there. Or the um, unquestioning sheep, unfortunately, who blindly follow them till this very day. Remember what we discussed last week? Woe to the shepherd and woe to the flock. So, the king commanded to burn all three of them in fire. But God doesn't play that now, does he? Right? The angel Michael descended and saved Yehoshua from the fire. The full numerical value of Michael, meaning if you spell every letter, so Mem Yud Kaf Aleph Lamed, but if you spell Mem, how do you spell the letter Mem? Mem Mem. Yud is Yud Vav Dalet. Kaf is a. Uh, uh, Kaf and Pei, uh, Aleph, Aleph, Lamed, Pei, and Lamed, Lamed, Mem, Dalid. All these have the same numerical value of Shechina, which is 385. Which is why our sages say that when the Shechina is seen, Michael, Michael, the, the great angel, is seen. Furthermore, when Jacob spoke of the redeeming angel who saved him from evil, the angel who saves... He was referring to Michael. He is on the side of mercy, as we know. And what did he do over here? He brought up Yehoshua before the throne of glory, as seen in, Je in uh, Zechariah 3.1. And he showed me Yehoshua, Hakohen Hagador, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord. And Satan was standing on his right to accuse him. So Zechariah is seeing this trial right now when Michael saved Yehoshua the high priest and brought him for judgment. Okay, why were they all standing before the throne of glory? Because God is now going to decide whether or not he can merit to be saved. God could either pause time or again, when we go outside of time, it doesn't interrupt the flow of time as we know it in the spirit realm, right? So it's at that moment, here's his judgment, as he can do and will do and probably does for every one of us. And how can this even be considered a fair trial without the prosecutor doing his thing, right? Of course, this is why he's doing his job. This is why he's there. 
But the other two, Zedekiah and Ahab, were burned with fire, as said in Jeremiah 29, 22. And a curse shall be taken from them by the entire exile of Judah, which is in Babylon, saying, May the Lord make you like Zedekiah and like Ahab, whom the king of Babylon burnt with fire. Now listen, the only reason we are saying burnt with fire is because of the English and Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer addresses this. Let's read this in Hebrew, shall we? Ketzid kiyau ukeachav, asher kalam melech bavel ba'esh. Okay, it is not written, says our text, who were burned by fire, but rather it is written asher kalam, who were cursed by fire. Now kalam, specifically it's written here, kuf lamed mem, with the letter kuf, comes from the word kalala, le kalel kalam. Okay, so again, it's it's biblical, kalala, curse, as opposed to kalem, kuf lamed mem, which means to consume or to incinerate. The word klum, nothing, is the same thing. Kaf, kaf, not kuf, kaf lamed mem. This is the word that Bilam would say, and he would make million man armies disappear. That's why they hired him. He was a, uh, he was a, uh, what do you call it? He was a mercenary, basically. He would say one, we would connect to all the, you know, the worst forces possible. One word, Kalem, boom, they're all gone. They disappear, they cease to exist. This is not that, this is they are cursed in the fire. So this can be understood if we pay attention to the entire verse. So we learned that the hairs on his head were cinched due to their sins. The hairs on whose head? We're about to read in Zechariah 3, 2. And the Lord said to Satan, Listen, the Lord shall rebuke you, O Satan, and the Lord shall rebuke you. The Lord shall rebuke you. He who chose Jerusalem. Is this one not a brand plucked from the fire? He's speaking of Yehoshua. And speaking of false prophets and rabbis, you've heard the saying, I'm sure, that if you rebuke Satan, he will flee from you, right? We've all heard this insanity. And yet it says right here in our verse that only God can and will rebuke Satan. And so by default, anyone else that tells you otherwise is not only a liar, but he's putting you in danger as well. People walk around thinking they can rebuke Satan and he'll flee from you. Not what the word of God says. Sorry. Okay. So not only did Yehoshua's hairs get cinched, but his garments did as well, meaning his externalities, again, because uh, because them, not him, uh, while the man himself was clean. So they got burnt. His externalities from the outside, he sort of got, you know, little bit messed up in the fire, but he physically was okay. So as we can see in the next few verses, let's read three and four. Now, Yoshua was wearing filthy garments and standing before the angel. And he, the angel, raised his voice and said to those standing before him, saying, take the filthy garments off him. And he said to him, see, I have removed your iniquity from you, and I have clad you with clean garments. And I said, let them put on a pure miter, meter, I'm not sure, it's sniff, on his head, and they put a pure meter, my, my meter, what a, I'm sorry, on his head, and they had clothed him with garments while the angel of the Lord was standing. Rabbi Yehuda says, when Nebuchadnezzar brought a false accusation against Israel to slay them, he set up an idol in the plain of Dura. Now this is, this is very interesting, right? The Hebrew used the false accusation as alilot, he made up stories. What kind of, you're trying to whip up all these stories. You're trying to make up these stories. You're trying to accuse somebody by, again, making things up. None of these things happened. So this is what Nebuchadnezzar was trying to, to do to Israel. How so? Look what he actually did. But it's not stories per se, but rather he came up with a catch-22 situation for them. This, of course, is the large idol that he built. He knew that if they had if that if they would bow down to it, God would kill them. But if they didn't, then he had an excuse to kill them. So, in other words, if they do it, 
They're damned if they do and they're damned if they don't, right? So let's read from our text. So he made a declaration and said, anyone who does not bow down to the image shall be burned by fire. But Israel did not trust in the shadow of their maker, and they and their wives and sons bowed down to the image. Our sages say that if this were the case, then that entire generation should have been destroyed as they had the death penalty coming to them. If all of Israel then bow down to the idol, it's one of the, you know, let's just read, right, from the Ten Commandments. I am the Lord your God who took you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall not have the gods of others in my presence. You shall not make for yourself a a graven image or any likeness which is in the heavens above, which is on the earth below, or which is in the water beneath the earth. Let's say they had no control over any of these things. They were placed there. The image was already there. But how are they going to get around this one? You shall neither prostrate yourself before them nor worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a zealous God who visits the iniquity of the fathers upon the sons, upon the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. Bow down to an idol? You hate God. That's what he says. Don't, you know, have a problem with that. And I perform loving kindness to thousands of generations, to those who love me, and to those who keep my commandments. Okay. So, the commentators don't mention this, but this is something that I picked up on specifically from these verses. Who visits the iniquity of the fathers upon the sons, upon the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. So, they bow down, right? We know this because it only speaks of the three that did not bow down. So they did bow down. So we've learned about this before, how it may seem to be negative, but in fact, it's a positive. Meaning, wait, God is going to hold three, four generations because of the sins of the father, grandfather, great-grandfather, and so on? So how so? Because God, because just as God holds the iniquity of the sinners for three or four generations, this is what we call family curses and whatnot, that only means that it is an opportunity for three or four generations forward to redeem and correct the previous generations three or four generations back. We can never look at the command. That's the same thing like looking at, oh, all the commands, oh, it's such a burden. No, it's an opportunity. God says, listen, I'm connecting you to three or four generations back. If they did good, wonderful. You reap the benefits. But if they did bad, you get to do a tikkun for them. Amazing. This is how we can redeem our family's sins, but not following in their footsteps, as in the buck stops with us. In other words, I'm okay, I'm not doing what you did, and now I'm already going to do a tikkun. And by cleaning up their mess, if you will, by taking the path of God. As a result, we can redeem the sins of our fathers, grandfathers, great-grandfathers, and great-grandfathers. No one can tell me that God doesn't give us ample time to turn back time and correct our own lives. Ample time until time is running out, though, right? I mean, right? Okay. All right. So I say this because three or four generations forward, look at this. Three, four generations forward of this exact time period. And where are we? Exactly in the days of Esther. And what happened in the days of Esther? The decree actually did come out to wipe us all out by the hands of Haman, everybody. Mizaken ve'ataf, women, men, children, the old, the young, everybody dead in one day. That was the decree. That could have or possibly should have, maybe it did, who knows, we'll see, happen on that one day. So, since we collectively did shuva, as we just read in Esther, and took upon ourselves once again the oral and written law of the Torah. We strengthened ourselves. We rededicated our lives to God. We were spared, thereby redeeming our forefathers for bowing down to idols, you see. This, of course, is it's only my opinion, but it's an observation I made. Makes sense to me. If it makes sense to you, then we all just learned something new here today. So, wonderful. Now, what our sages do say, is that they warranted destruction in the days of Haman because they partook in the most unholy and debaucherous festivities of Haman and Achashverosh at his 180-day-long party, right? That, In other words, that was, I wouldn't say that that was it, but that was like the final straw, you understand? Like as it was, they were sort of, 
yeah, it's all good, right? But now that they're completely assimilated, going with what the nations are doing, no. And by the way, Haman knew this, which is why they were invited, even though back then Jews were second-class citizens. Haman specifically invited them. Come, yeah. Don't you understand? When Jews disappear is because we are welcomed by the nations. That's, that, that's, that's the trick. When you hate the Jews, when there's, you know, because look what was happening during the Holocaust 80 years ago, right? The Jews were blending in. They were proud Germans, proud Polacks or whatever. They were proud wherever they were first and second. Oh, yeah, I'm a Jew, by the way. The time of the Enlightenment, if you will. As a result, look what happened. In comes Haman 2.0. You, uh, you got Hitler, and I don't care what you identify as. I don't care what party you voted for. I don't care if you're Ashkenaz or Sephardi, although back then, it, I mean, specifically in Europe, they're only Ashkenazi. I don't care if you have a beard. I don't care if you're Orthodox or if you're this. You're a Jew. Your grandmother was a Jew. Oh, hey. It's a, what are you thinking? Let's put, let's, okay, all the guys with the long beards, let's put them in this section in Auschwitz. And those that don't identify as Jews, but are really Jews in that section, all, everybody together went into the same gas chamber. They don't care. Why do we care? There's your problem for the second temple destruction. Aside from that, I'm just, a, I got beef right now with my people going at each other's throats. But as we know, there are 70 faces to Torah. And we will see some new outlooks regarding things that we have learned before. So if you don't understand this concept, okay, some people might be new over here. How could this be? This guy says like this. This guy says like that. Here's how this works. How there can be a difference of opinion without definitive contradiction. It's a simple explanation. I'll give you this example. 2 plus 2, 2 times 2, 5 minus 1, 3 plus 1, 4 times 1, 100 minus 96, 300 divided by 75, all equals 4, right? And so many other options to equal 4. Different opinion, all based on biblical facts, no contradiction resulting in the same outcome. That's the 70 faces of Torah. Hence, 70 faces and then some. Back to our text. But Israel did not trust in the shadow of their maker, and they and their wives and sons bowed down to the image, except for Daniel, right? Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who called upon the name of the Lord. The Radal says that Ezekiel was also there at the time, as we know, but he fled the scene as not to be put in that situation. A lot of Jews actually there were hiding. They didn't want, no one wants to get dragged before an idol in that situation. So they rounded up whoever they could. In fact, many of Israel either fled, right, fled the crowd or hid amongst the Babylonians, it says. So we already know that just because we read a verse or section in the Torah, it doesn't mean that it's all happening at that very moment in sequence with the same amount of time that it takes us to read about it, right? Reading the uh, portion of the week, if we're reading going from Exodus, from the time we read the book of Exodus towards the end of the book of Numbers, there's only two years. And then all of a sudden it jumps at the end of the book of Numbers, 38 years in the future. You see? So what it's going on. We need. We learn what we need to know, and the rest of the time, you can imagine what they did, which is what just how we're learning the Torah. They're learning and living the Torah. That's what they did for thirty-eight years in the wilderness. Okay. So, we already know. Uh, just because, like we said, just because we read the timelines, it doesn't necessarily make it the same thing. So sometimes years could go by between words, even in the same verse, just like we learned with Abraham and Ishmael from the time after Abraham sent Ishmael away and then said, and his mother chose a wife for him. In between that verse, there's a three-year time lapse. And we gave it in that example, I think the teaching was called Ishmael, if I'm not mistaken, or yeah, it was the, what was it? It was the ninth trial of Abraham. Okay, so when we read in Daniel 3, 17, 18, about the three throwing the king's, uh, throwing the king's commands back in his face, it was actually Ezekiel who counseled them in between verses 17 and 18. Listen, 
Behold, there is our God whom we worship. This is when Nebuchadnezzar is like, y'all want to die? Can your God save you? Behold, there is our God whom we worship. He can save us from the burning fiery furnace and from your hands, O king. He will save us. That's a bold statement. In other words, if he doesn't do that, then you just said that God is going to do something and he doesn't do it. It makes, it makes God look bad. It makes you look like a fool, right? This is where Ezekiel comes in and corrects them, okay? Which essentially saved them. And if not, this is what he told them to say, and if not, meaning we accept our fate either way. If not, let it be known to you, O king, that we will not worship your God, neither will we prostrate ourselves to the golden image that you have set up. In other words, sure, of course God could save us. But even if he doesn't save us, we're not bowing down to an idol. That's it. And it would be disgraceful for them to burn him. This is what Pirkei Derbe Eliezer says. So what, 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 what's going on? This obviously needs explanation. Who is them? It would be disgraceful for them to burn him. Who is them? The Babylonians. Who is him? Daniel. Why? Why did they not throw Daniel into the fire with his friends since he did not bow down to the idol? Because it is written in Daniel 4, verse 5. Let's just go back to verse 1 so you have some context here. I, Nebuchadnezzar, this is Nebuchadnezzar speaking. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was tranquil in my house and flourishing in my palace. I saw a dream and it frightened me. And the thoughts of uh, the thoughts on my bed and the visions of my mind terrified me. So I issued an order to bring it before me, all the wise men of Babylon, that they should let me know the meaning of the dream. Then the necromancers, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the demonologists, Kasdai, uh, yeah, sh 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 Shadim, or demons, and the demonologists entered, and I related my dream to them, but they did not tell me its meaning, until at last. Daniel, whose name is Belshazzar, like the name of my God, entered before me in whom is the spirit of the holy angels, and I told him the dream. Do you see this? So because he answered his dream two chapters ago in Daniel, they changed his name from Daniel to Belshazzar, which is the name of the Babylonian God. That's why they didn't want to burn him, because of the name that the king and the people called him by, Belshazzar, like the name of their god. And why do they call him a necromancer, which is in Aramaic, a chaltumia? Okay, we, we've seen, the, where have we seen this word before? Chaltumia or chaltumim. Exodus 7.11. Vaikra gam paro lachachamim ulemachashvim vayasu gam hem chaltumei mitzrayim belahatehem ken. Then Pharaoh too summoned the wise men and the magicians and the necromancers of Egypt who also did likewise with their magic. Mm. Sorry, I've been speaking a lot today. <clears throat> So why? Because they obviously don't really know the difference. They're like, okay, you're, you're speaking with, you know, demons, angels. To them, it was the same thing, right? In other words, not human beings. To them, angels, the spirits, whatever, right? As a result of Daniel being untouchable at this point. So that's why he didn't get thrown in the fire. And they tossed Hananiah, Mishael, and, Az and Azariah in the fiery furnace. And we know the story. As it says in Daniel 3.25, he called out and said, Behold, I see four men walking in the midst of the fire, and there is no wound upon them. And the form of the fourth is likened to a son of God, meaning an angel, as we can, and I have to clarify this, meaning we can read this where in Job 2.1, Now the day came about that the sons of of God came to stand beside the Lord and the adversary too. This is Rosh Hashanah, the day of judgment. Also, we see this in Genesis 6 2 that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, not Ha'adam. Many sons of God. Again, you need to know what context because God calls Israel his firstborn son. Exodus 4.22. Now, why do I have to clarify all these uh, all these times specifically from the text? This is painfully obvious, yet it's a misunderstood concept. 
All right? You know why. It's for you. So now you can answer anybody who says anything different. Text, verse. Our text says the following. And Gabriel descended and saved them from the fiery furnace. So who was the who was the son of God that came? This was Gabriel. But wait, didn't we say earlier that it was Michael who saved Yehoshua, the high priest, from the fire, and that he specifically is the angel who saves? Great question. We know Michael is the angel of mercy. He's a side of water, which makes Gabriel the angel of judgment, fire. The Radal cites Yalkut Yechezkel, where it says that it was Michael who saved them, but in Masechet Psachim, it says that it was Gabriel. And that it was, that's actually what holds more water, no pun intended, as it even makes more sense. Gabriel is the one who answered Daniel's call later on in that book, who also referred to calling upon Michael for assistance in chapter 10. So, chapter 10, verse 12 and 13, and he said to me, this is, the, it says, the man Gabriel spoke to Daniel, and he said to me, fear not Daniel, for since the first day that you set your heart to contemplate and to fast before your God, your words were heard, and I have come because of your words. And the prince of the kingdom of Persia has been standing against me for 21 days, and behold, Michael, one of the first princes, has come to help, and I remained there beside the king of Persia. Okay. So furthermore, the Radal cites Yalkut Daniel, where it says the following. When Nebuchadnezzar saw... Oh, just one more thing I want to say. Did I write this down or did I not write this down? No, I didn't write this down. Another thing, they're saying that it was actually a bigger miracle or a bigger deal that it was Gabriel, the angel of fire, who saved them from fire. In other words, he went against his own, I don't want to say nature, but how God fashioned him. Because easily enough, sure, you could have Michael whose water go into the fire and save them. But it was actually fire who saved them from fire. So that's why it was a bigger deal that it was Gabriel. Okay? Although, where he says, and we've learned about this, I forgot when, a few weeks ago, a few months ago, where he says, He who makes peace in his heavens. How does he make peace? Because you have fire and you have water. They are together, yet they're separate, yet they're together, and there's no... There's no, uh, what do you call it? There's no conflict or contradiction between them. Fire and water coexist. We even saw this actually in the plague of uh, hail, right? Huge ice cubes came down with fire inside them. How? Right? Between Gabriel and between Michael. So, the Radal cites Yelkut Daniel while saying the following. When Nebuchadnezzar saw the angel Gabriel in the fire... His entire physical being was in shock and terror. It says, Kol Evarav, every, his whole body was like, uh, started convulsing. As he said, I saw him in the war of San Kharib, and he incinerated the entire camp. This was obviously before the Babylonian exile, when San Kharib and his million-man army, oh yeah, marched upon Judah, down from the north to south, destroying everything along their way, exiling the ten tribes, but he never took Jerusalem, nor was a single arrow fired upon her. They besieged Jerusalem, but that was the prayer that uh, that uh, Hezekiah made. Remember, we discussed this, Hezekiah and Isaiah, you do everything you can, and then God brings them around. Why? To make them all disappear. So we learned this a few weeks ago. What happened? 185,000 generals were incinerated and all the rest fled. Where it says that, and the whole army? No, the 185,000 were only the generals and the commanders of the million man army. Now listen to the next part because it's important. When you join the other side and go against God, the Sitra Achra, right? Don't think for a second that you will be protected. A lot of people do, unfortunately, because they, again, false promises and whatnot. King Nebuchadnezzar said to them, to Israel, you know that you have a God who protects and saves. Who called Nebuchadnezzar to come and get Israel? Who's God, right? Punishment, correction. Y'all sinned. What did we say in Deuteronomy? If you sin and you do A, B, and C, I'm going to take you out of the land because now you've contaminated the land. This is exact. God did exactly what he said he was going to do. So who sent Nebuchadnezzar? 
right? King Nebuchadnezzar said to them, to Israel, you know that you have a God who protects and saves. You know this. Everyone knows this. But I know I got permission right now. That's why I came in. No one stopped me. Why have you forsaken your God and bowed down to an idol that has no power to save? They're not idiots, as dumb as they are. They know this. They're choosing this because that's the root that they come from. Israel needs to know better. Nebuchadnezzar was evil incarnate. He, Pharaoh, Titus, Nimrod, they all come from the same source. Remember Hitler. Why was Hitler obsessed with killing Jews? Because we are God's people. Why? No one could say this. Ask this to why? God's people. Why was he not obsessed with killing Christians? See what I'm saying? Okay. Remember what happens when you leave your God because you are afraid of man. And now Nebuchadnezzar is calling you out on your hypocrisy. You think this wasn't a test from God, this situation right here? Everything is a test from God. It's not only how you survive, but how you live. I know we can reason and understand what's right and what's wrong, but to be in a situation like that, specifically, bow down or I'm gonna kill you, and your fam you're with your wife and children, all you, you either bow down or you're all dead. I honestly can't tell you, right? I can tell you what I would need to do, but honestly, if I was in that situation, I'll be very honest with you. I have no idea what I would do. I would hope that I would do the right thing, but how does one do that? You understand? That's why it's no small feat to give your life in an instance like this for the sake of God. Would you allow your entire family to be slaughtered before your eyes? That's why we also can't judge anybody in that situation. Because it's easy to say, well, they did this. But when you're placed in that situation, don't judge. Because tell you what, there's a good chance we might all be in that situation in one, in one way or another. So... Yeah. All right. And I actually I had to write this down. So I do believe, however, that such a time has already started. What with all the governmental and social pressure, as we've seen over the past three years. In other words, take bow down to the mask, masicha, as we say, or or else. But that, as we say, was just a test run. So really, really do not take this lightly. I say this, may God give us strength to stand against evil, tyranny, idolatry, and everything that is wrong with this world. We are going to need all the help we can get. We cannot do that, this on our own. And may he grant us strength and insight to always do what is right in his eyes, not in ours, no matter the consequences. Amen. Okay. It is Satan's job to entice you. That's his literal job, as dictated by God. He's not a rogue agent, as we discussed. There is no such thing as a rogue agent. If there was, then God would not be sovereign, and that's that within itself is blasphemous. So again, no one can say, Satan made me do it. No, he didn't. He fooled you into doing it. He enticed you. No one can make you do anything. Not Satan, not God. This is by design. This is your free will. So if you do something, you did it. Nobody else. Satan's not going to stand there. Yeah, God, my bad. I God's like, I mean, think about that for a second. Really? Satan's going to be, I made him do it. God's like, no, you didn't. Your job was to entice him. He did it. Hence, free will. This does not work, logically. But again, a whole group of people are saying... He's the bad guy. But the moment you get enticed by he who entices you, you will be accused by he who accuses. It's the same person. Like, come on, man. It's good. Come in and you say, ha, ha, ha. Gotcha, sucker. That's what's going on. There is no refuge or future for you. And no excuses will ever hold up in the high court. Isaiah 28 says, Therefore, listen to the word of the Lord, men of scorn, allegorists of his of this people who are in Jerusalem. For you said, this we're talking about right now, people right now, this is what's going on. For you said we have made a treaty with death and with the grave, and we have set a limit. When an overflowing scourge passes, because they know what's coming, 
Most people don't know what's coming. They know exactly what's coming and when it's coming. An overflowing scourge passes. It shall not come upon us, right? Maybe we made a treaty with death. For we have made lies our shelter, and in falsehood have we hidden ourselves. Building things beneath the ground is not going to help anybody. If I conform and do what I am told, no harm will come to me. Yes, big government, is what Israel said in Babylon. But this is a lesson for us all. Therefore, so has the Lord God said, Behold, I have laid as a foundation a stone in Zion, a fortress stone, a costly cornerstone, a foundation well founded. The believer shall not hasten. And I will make justice the line and righteousness the plummet and hail shall sweep away the shelters of lies. You can, lies will not save anybody. And water shall flood the hiding places. So we already know what's going to happen to them. And your treaty with death shall be annulled, and your limit with the grave shall not endure, and an overflowing scourge passes. You shall be trampled by it. Oh, I believe you. Whoa. When it passes, it shall take you. For every morning it shall pass by day and by night, and it shall be only terror to understand the message. We must never let it get that far. The moment we make that deal with death or with the death peddlers, our end shall be as their end. Don't do this. Nebuchadnezzar continues, just as you have done this, turned your back to your God, which caused the destruction in your home, so too do you wish to do in my land to destroy it. And the king commanded that all should be slain by the sword. All the Jews who were in the vicinity, which was almost all the Jews of Babylon, were killed by Nebuchadnezzar for bowing down to the idol and forsaking their God. Right then and there. And that, my friends, is God's judgment acting swiftly and with great mercy. How mercy? Because it is a small price to pay for your soul to find redemption in death. Right? You don't want to lose your soul. Lose your life. You'll come back. But whoa. And how do we know that they were all slain by the sword? As said in Ezekiel 37.9. Then he said to me, prophesy to the spirit, prophesy, O son of man, and say to the spirit, so says the Lord God, from four sides come, O spirit, and breathe into these slain ones that they may live. Now, I know we've, this is obviously Valley of the Dry Bones. I know we've learned about that this is the tribe of Ephraim, but this is yet another opinion based on Torah, 70 faces I taught all about it, the tribe of Ephraim, they left 30 years early from Egypt. We could see it in Exodus, that's why God did not take them in the way of the Philistines. We've discussed this before, okay? Here's another way to look at it. So, and where was the place? Where is this actual valley of the dry bones? In the valley of Shinar. Does the name sound familiar? Where the idol of Nebuchadnezzar stood in Babylon where the Tower of Babel stood, and where the land beneath it was filled with the corpses of all the giants and abominable creatures created by man during the days of the flood. Whoa, talk about unholy ground. Ah, where you are now, wherever you are in the world, you too are on unholy ground. If you are not in the land of Israel, wherever you are is unholy ground by default. Granted, there are places that are more unholy than others, but anything out of, if Israel is holy, by default, the rest of the world is not. And there's plenty of sources. Like I said, I really want to teach about this someday. Um, okay. <clears throat> but it doesn't mean that you, just because you are on unholy ground as Israel were, it doesn't mean that you can't do what's right. To the contrary, it's crucial because you are on unholy ground. Because that is where God placed you. He wants you there. 
to do what's right where you are, obviously. Start working towards you getting over here, right? But God placed you there. And in our story, only three did not bend the knee. But just as our ancestors were on unholy ground, they still had a choice to do the right thing, to take the hard choice, to make the right call. May God give us strength to do the same. And that is our class. So stay tuned for next week. I believe we're still going to have a class next week. Yeah, we should have a class next week before, before Passover. Next week, we will be discussing Ezekiel and the Valley of the Dry Bones. So thank you so much for joining me. Have a wonderful rest of the week and have a Shabbat Shalom. Bye-bye.